Thank you very much to the EGA conference. This has been a, such a wonderful, outstanding conference. I'm very honored to, to be here. I'm very grateful to all those that have invited me. I'm Dr. Mark Slabaugh. I'm here on behalf of Anna as one of the international ambassadors. So I'm very grateful also to Anna to allow me the, to come and speak to you today. I get the, uh, the talk about what are the tips and tricks of the latter J. Uh, many of the surgeons have already talked about this particular procedure before. But uh, initially, I'd like to, to thank uh, Professor Aziz, Professor Ahmed, and Professor Morsi for having us here, for having Anna. We're very grateful for this collaboration. I agree with Dr. Plancher. It is absolutely one of the opportunities that we get to cross-pollinate and to be able to share ideas because the things that you do here and the patients that you have are much different than sometimes that we have in the United States. So I'm very grateful for this collaboration. I'm feeling right at home. I'm from uh, Utah originally, and so that's a skiing area. I did not know that you guys have a skiing area right here indoors, so I uh, apologize I did not bring my ski suit because I would love to join you on the ski slopes this afternoon after the conference is uh, over. I have to disclose that I am an open latter day surgeon. I was in the military for 24 years, and many of my patients, as you know, in the military, we have a very high rate of dislocation just because of the activities that we do. And some of the activities are very analogous to the rugby players and to the contact athletes. And I felt like in my hands, the open ladder jay was a more reproducible surgery. I know that that's probably sacrilege for some of the speakers that are here in the audience to do the arthroscopic, like Dr. Plancher. But I have always uh, relied on the open ladder jay in order to do that. So that's what I'm going to be discussing today. I think that it is very important. To, uh, I think that most of the tips and tricks that I've learned over the years are really how to avoid the complications. I think that where the latter J gets the bad reputation is because the complication rate is so high. You can see that historically the latter J has had up to about 30% of complications, whereas an arthroscopic bank card or even an open bank card in some studies has less than 1%. But I think it really depends on your description or the types of complications that you're looking at. The major complications definitely favor the bank card procedure over the latter J. However, you know, that is starting to come down now as we become more adept in the arthroscopic and also the open latter J procedures. There's been a recent systematic review from uh, Dr. Rolick in 2017 that looked at the bank card and latter J and looked at the complications. For the latter J, he reported 9.5%, and then for the bank cards, very interestingly, it was 0%. If you look at uh, other studies and looking at the, co uh, the complications, uh, there's several ways that we can define those complications. First of all, you can look at the complications that happen very shortly after the surgery, the 30-day readmission rate or the 30-day reoperation rate, and those include patients that have had infections or thromboembolic events. And even with the bank card, that's about 0.5% in this study, and then 2.5% for the bank, or sorry, for the latter J's. Another systematic review that looked at more in depth uh, the differences between the latter J and the bank card uh, 795 patients, of which uh, 416 were bank cards and 379 open latter J's. The dislocation rate for these particular patients was 9.5% for the bank cards, whereas it was only 5% for the latter J's. The row scores, surprisingly, were better for the latter J's than the bank cards. And then actually, the loss of external rotation, which we classically sometimes think of, that occurs with the latter J because of that sling effect, was actually better in the latter J population than in the bank card in this particular systematic review. Complications were 3% for the bank card and then 5% for the latter J. So really, it's all about how we avoid these complications. I think that the latter J definitely has a very high and very long learning curve. But once you get there, you can definitely decrease the, the complications. So I'd just like to share my experiences in the military. And so I have to take this opportunity to thank those patients that allowed me to be able to participate in their care. Because I really owe my experience from the latter J to the soldiers, sailors, and airmen that I was privileged to take care of in the 24 years that I was in the military. I think it begins with uh, proper patient selection in the United States. We definitely have a lot different patient population that you sometimes have. You can see these uh, French officers, very you know, sleek and very thin, much easier to do a latter J in that particular patient than the patients that we typically sometimes see in, on the right in the United States. So I think that really choosing your patient pro appropriately is uh, key to the first step in uh, success in the latter J. For uh, all the other speakers that have talked about sort of the indications, I think in my hands, I very much agree with uh, Dr. Tokish and Dr. Shaha, who've looked at subcritical bone loss 
And so if you're doing this procedure for patients that have less than 13.5% bone loss, I think that those patients would be better served with a bank cart, uh, maybe plus or minus a remplissage. Epileptics are very, very difficult to treat in this uh, particular, in patients that have bone loss. I think epilepsy is probably a, definitely one of those patients that you want to be very, tread carefully with those. And then voluntary dislocators are very difficult with the latter J as well. And the last two are pretty obvious. If you've got a massive rotator cuff tear with a subscapularis tear, those patients do not do well with a latter J or in a very similar manner, failed arthroplasty with a failed subscap. So first of all, I'm looking at the intraoperative complications. Dr. Warr Walsh, who is very well known for his technique in the latter J, has looked at his position in patients, and he noted that it was 5% medialized, 10 to 53% of his patients were lateralized, superiorization was 36%, inferior he didn't report on very well, and then the proper position was really 4% in his hands. So it's a very, very technically demanding surgery. And if you look at your results very closely, it definitely is very humbling to see that. And then coracoid fracture was about 1.5% in another study. So how do you avoid these complications? Malposition, I think it's very important, uh, just like the previous discussers uh, have talked about. I drill my holes in the coracoid first. I chew two drill holes, and then I measure that distance. I'm very meticulous at measuring that distance so that I can make sure that I can reproduce that on the glenoid when I do the drill holes in the glenoid. I only drill one hole in the glenoid inferiorly at the five o'clock position to avoid being inferior. And then that second drill hole, I drill in the coracoid at the time I'm drilling that first hole, but then the second hole in the glenoid, I'll drill afterwards. And that allows me to rotate that graft. It's been shown very well by Dr. Arita as far as how to make sure you do that correctly and you get the proper position. Coracoid fracture, I think that it's very, very important that you look at your preoperative studies, both a, whether you get a CT scan or a 3D MRI, to make sure that your graft is long enough and wide enough. As you can see, there's been many good studies out there that have looked at the differences in patients. And so I agree with Dr. Planser. You really have to individualize the specific procedure you're doing for the patient that's in front of you in your clinic. And if it's not big enough, then you have to go to a distal tibial allograft, or iliac crest bone graft, or the distal clavicle. And then I cut right at the base of the coracoid. Obviously, you want to make sure that you have a long enough length in order to get enough uh, surface area to help with the healing. And then I use the inferior surface. I do not use the congruent arc. I think the congruent arc is a much more difficult and technically demanding procedure and doesn't give you as much surface area to heal back to the glenoid. If you're worried about how much real estate that you have, you can do either a two and a half or a 2.8 millimeter drill bit. I also I like the lag technique, and so typically I'm using a three and a half millimeter drill bit on that coracoid, and then a two and a half millimeter drill bit on the glenoid. And just like the previous uh, discussions have talked about, you, make, you wanna make sure that you only get that two finger tightness to avoid that fracture. If you do have a fracture, there's several ways that you can get out of this bad situation. If you fracture at the waist with one of the screws, then you can use a glenoid anchor and then just use a soft tissue anchor and go through the conjoint tendon in order to provide that second point of fixation. If you fracture it lengthwise, which I have not seen, uh, but you can use uh, basically two anchors, one medially and one lateral, in order to compress that graft back down in order to still get that, hopefully, that bone block and the advantages that we know that come from restoring the glenoid vault. Neuropraxy is another thing that can inter uh, occur interoperatively. Overall, it's been shown to be about 1.5%. But that increases if you look at uh, your patients with neuromonitoring during the case. Unfortunately, if you do have a neuropraxia, the results are pretty dismal. One of the studies out of France looked at their complication rates. If you have a musculocutaneous nerve palsy, almost uh, over 80% of those are permanent. Axillary, it's a little bit better with about 33% being uh, permanent. Brachial plexus is 75% permanent. And then suprascapular nerve has really not been looked at very well, but they have shown in different studies that if you have your trajectory more than 28 degrees caudal, then you're worried or you're having that nerve at risk for your screws because you definitely want to get two cortices of fixation for the latter J procedure. How to avoid the neuropraxy? I think that the first thing is that you have to be very meticulous with the placement of your retractors. If you're doing other open type of procedures, say for shoulder arthroplasty, you always have that conjoint tendon to give you a little bit of protection to your neurovascular bundle. However, we've already cut 
your coracoid, so you do not have that bone block in order to protect you, and you don't have that glen or sorry, the conjoint tendon to protect you. So I think it's very important. I put a sponge in the glenoid vault, and I provide and just put that on the retractor just to give me a little bit more protection. And then I do not dissect for two reasons: a medial on the conjoint tendon, number one, to protect the vascular supply, but also that attachment helps provide just a little bit of at least gives me a little bit more comfort that I'm not retracting the brachial plexus or the musculocutaneous nerve. And just like it's been shown in previous lectures, uh, I split the subscap at the mid portion of the subscapularis. I identify the three sisters and then identify the superior border of the subscapularis and basically just take that distance in half and that's where I split my subscapularis. And then always at the end, I check the musculocutaneous nerve after you've put the, the conjoint tendon and the coracoid back down to the glenoid just to make sure. I've had one patient where I've actually had to do a neurolysis of the musculocutaneous nerve because it was draped over the subscapularis and that's a very difficult procedure to do afterwards. So it's important to check before you put the, the coracoid down just to see how far that musculocutaneous nerve is to the tip of the coracoid just to make sure that you don't have that uh, the need to do a neurolysis at the end. And then if you're trying to avoid the subscapular nerve, or sorry, the subscapular nerve, then you want to avoid that 28 degrees of caudal trajectory in order to avoid penetrating at the spinal glenoid notch. Postoperative complications, infection, hematoma, non-union, and osteolysis. It's been shown in the literature that infection is about 6% with the latter J. Hematoma is about 1% to 2%, and the non-union is a 9%, but that increases and is obviously a risk factor if you're using unicortical fixation or a single screw, or if your uh, screw is too inferior where we know that the glenoid is not as uh, strong, the bone is not as strong down there. Osteolysis has been very well shown, uh, especially in the Italian literature, that that's up to about 60% of the graft. However, that decreases to about 40% if you've got glenoid bone loss. So you really obviously want to make sure that you match the amount of glenoid bone loss that you have with the graft that you're using. How to avoid the complications? Infection it gets back to choosing your patients very carefully. And anybody, uh, you probably don't have the, uh, the high incidence of diabetes as we do in the United States, but you want to make sure that your patients have less than an 8 hemoglobin A1C. And then for the smokers, I'm very adamant that I will not do this operation in somebody who smokes. I think that uh, that is one of the things that definitely increases your risk of having uh, a bad complication and failure to, to have a united coracoid to the glenoid. Hematoma, I use TXA in all my patients. I do not use routinely a drain. And then osteolysis, so how to avoid that, you want to make sure that those screws are parallel to the joint. I think it's very important. And I'll show you in my technique a little bit later on how I do that. Non-union, you want, definitely want to make sure that you have a flat surface on both the coracoid and the glenoid to ensure that you've got maximal surface area for healing. And then two-finger tightness, I use two screws. I avoid cannulated screws. I like the hard stainless steel screws because they provide a little bit more compression uh, and avoid hopefully that non-union and especially if you do have a non-union the cannulated screws are much more prone to breakage. Instability is obviously the main thing that we're worrying about with this particular with all type of um, any instability surgeries. Dr. Hovelius was uh, in his uh, study found 5%, Dr. Walsh uh, almost 6%, Dr. Gerber 10% and Dr. Cole 5%. So even in the best of hands this is a procedure that still has a risk of instability. So how do we avoid the complication of instability? Rim plissage plus a ladder J is now starting to become a little bit more commonplace. However, in the literature, there's no good literature that looks at what the instability rate is. Dr. Millet out of Vail has looked at his sort of case series of three patients, and he hasn't had any instability in those three patients, but obviously that's too soon to, to tell. However, I think the biggest indication for how to avoid instability in these patients is that individuals that have more than 30% bone loss, those are the individuals that I think the latter J is really not going to be sufficient. And you have to look for a distal tibial allograft or an iliac crest bone graft or another type of bone block procedure in order to be able to really restore the amount of bone loss that you have in the patient that you've seen before you. Arthritis is definitely a risk, as it has been alluded to previously. Dr. Hovelius looked at his 15-year follow-up results. Moderate to severe was 14%, minor was 35%. And then Dr. Walsh, at 20 years after doing the latter J, 20% of his patients had osteoarthritis. And those patients had pre-existing osteoarthritis. When he did his latter J, it was almost 50%. So how to avoid arthritis? Absolutely, it's avoiding a prominent bone block. 
if you're going to air, you want to air medially, but obviously you want to get it just right, but lateral is definitely not the way to go. You want to make sure that you have your screws parallel to the joint. You know, there's many proprietary guides from some of the different uh, authors, or sorry, some of the uh, different companies out there that allow you to do that. But I think that uh, the, the key is that making sure that those screws are parallel to the joint line so that you avoid the prominent screws because most patients are going to have osteolysis has been shown before. So it's, again, it's all about exposure. And I'm just going to go through very, very quickly. I apologize. This has been done before, but uh, basically I do this in the beach chair position. Uh, about 50 degrees, all these patients have significant anterior instability. So if you're a little bit more vertical, it's a lot more difficult because the humeral head is always popping out. I use a standard deltopectoral approach. Dr. Reed has talked about this, so I'm going to go through these slides pretty, pretty quickly. I think that it's very important to the position that you're putting the patient in when you're trying to cut the, the different ligaments or trying to release the soft tissue attachments from the coracoid. And the internal rotation, that's when I will cut my CA ligament about one centimeter from the insertion, and that allows me to help uh, repair that at the end. And then I'll externally rotate the arm, and that's when I cut the pectoralis minor. And I think it's very important to get the depth right. I'll use a cob basically to protect the neurovascular bundle on the medial side. Basically, that pushes the neurovascular bundle medially, but that also gives me my depth so that I know that I'm right on the base or the vault of the glenoid, and then I can put my oscillating saw, my right angle saw, right at that area to get it perfectly every time. Uh, so we've talked about this before. You really want to make sure that you are measuring the amount of bone that you have on the glenoid to make sure that it gets it right, that you get the screw lengths appropriate. And then uh, basically, uh, we've talked about this before and it's been shown before. And then what I'll do is I'll put my screw, a 3.5 millimeter screw that's a solid screw, about one to two centimeters proud. And that allows me really to find that drill hole that I've done before very easily and then I'll drill for the second screw and then like we've talked about before you really want to make sure this is two fingers tight and then I think it's very important to check for lateral overhang before you put that second screw in and then you can end either internally or externally rotate the graft to make sure if you do if you are somewhat lateralized you can burr down the, the coracoid a little bit but you really want to avoid that because it is definitely a little bit more can I get just a little bit more time uh, you want to make sure that uh, you're not burring down too much because you're worried about that amount of bone that you do have on the coracoid. So I just want to give a little bit of a plug now for Anna. Uh, obviously, Anna is uh, the reason why that I'm here, and it's a very wonderful organization, especially there's many benefits for international fellows. So I would encourage you to become a member. It's very easy. You just go to anna.com slash login. I'd just like to talk a little bit about the benefits of international for international fellows. There's a lot of continuing education courses. These are both available online and live at the OLC. There's discounted registration for the annual meeting as well as specialty day and the advanced lab courses, etc. Uh, any of the ANA members get the arthroscopy journal for free, but there's also other uh, opportunities that you have. You can get the arthroscopy techniques, which are wonderful videos that go over how a particular surgeon does a surgery, and that's all free. But the thing that I'd really like to emphasize is that for international members, we always have at least five scholarship opportunities that I would encourage you to apply for as an ANA member. And that allows you to either attend the ANA, ANA uh, annual meeting or to go to the OLC for the course of your choice. And that's a wonderful opportunity. This last year we had five scholarships. This year I think that we're going to have ten. So it's going to be a wonderful opportunity for you. And then international members can serve on committees and also hold office within ANA, which I think is a wonderful opportunity really to be able to have that uh, discussion and collaboration between the different nations. The dues are $150. Like I mentioned before, you get arthroscopy, you get arthroscopy podcasts, you get the arthroscopic techniques, and then ASMR, which is basically our open access journal. You can follow us on social media. So thank you very much for this opportunity to present.